When you look at a photograph of yourself as a child, when you study the hairstyle your mother has given you, the braids, when you look at the parting to see if it's straight or if it's crooked, does that give you insight into your life back then? Does it tell you whether you were happy or whether you were afraid? Can you see if your father had been drunk the night before? Or if your mother had touched you with feelings of love or feelings of dislike even? And this photograph of your mother as a prisoner with a shaved head holding a cat in her arms, what does it tell you about the feelings of that cat? What does it tell you about your mother? And when you see the shaved heads of neo-Nazis today, can you also see the misconceptions inside their minds? These visible signs give some kind of insight into a world where drunken fathers beat traumatized mothers, where frightened girls have nightmares, where power-crazed dictators imprison women and kill opponents. Can these signs also be manipulated to uncover an alternative way of looking at the world? Can they be used as signs of resistance? Do they have some kind of a magical quality? Can there be a world where the powerless have power over these very same symbols that have been used to oppress them? Can a single hair on a woman's shoulder work as a tool of resistance? This is Hertha Müller's wager with the face of power. Just over 300 years ago, the wars between Austria and the Ottoman Empire left a corner of what is now the border of Romania and Serbia more or less devastated and depopulated. The Austrians decided to settle the regions mainly with farmers from Swabia, and it remained a part of the Austrian-Hungarian Empire until after the First World War, where it was divided between Serbia and Romania. And this is where Hertha Müller comes from. She was destined, you might say, to have a problematic relationship with the land of her birth. Her grandfather had been a success as a farmer and as a merchant, but when the communists came to power, his property was confiscated. And her grandfather appears again and again as an important figure in her works. Her mother, too, an important figure in her works, was deported to Ukraine by the Soviets, where she spent several years in a labor camp. And her father, also so important in her works, was a member of the Waffen-SS. Remember them? So Hertha Müller came from a German-speaking background, a German-speaking immigrant background, and she attended the German school in her hometown of Nitschidorf. And then she studied German and Romanian at the University of Timisoara and graduated in 1976. After graduating, she took on a job as a translator in a factory. And um, soon she was approached by an employee of the Securitate, the secret intelligent agency and secret police of the Romanian state. And they wanted to enlist her services to see if she would help them passing on information that she obtained from spying on her fellow workers. And as you know, this was a favorite tool of domination, of exercising power and controlling the population in many of the Eastern Bloc states. The secret agency had been established by the Romanian government shortly after the end of the Second World War, and by the time Müller wrote, it had become notorious for its brutality, and throughout the country it was widely feared. And by the time she was asked to spy for the government, the country had been ruled for more or less 10 years by Nicolae Ceausescu. Ceausescu had initially been greeted as a kind of a popular reformer. The people seemed to like him. He was increasing, um, he was improving living standards, and um, the West also liked him a lot. Um, he, he, he didn't necessarily seem to side with the Soviets like some of the Eastern Bloc countries 
had done. So, for example, when Russian troops marched into Czechoslovakia in 1968, he refused to support them. However, he soon emerged as a ruthless dictator. After he became state president in 1974, he took on the title Condusator, which means more or less the same thing as Führer means in German, which you know means leader, but um, having been adopted by Adolf Hitler, it certainly means a whole lot more than that. One of the best known words, one of the best known German words in the English language. Ceausescu placed members of his family in leading political positions and he met any criticism or resistance with brutality and his uh, secret police and his secret intelligence agency was one of the tools he used to do that. Ceausescu had become the king who bows down and kills. When Ceausescu's secret police approached Hertha Müller, and tried to get her to spy for them, she refused. And her reason was that it didn't fit with her personality. She wasn't the kind of person who could do that. And as you can imagine, a refusal like this had severe consequences. So she was chastised at work. Her boss started asking her when she was gonna look for another job. And when she didn't look for another job, she lost her office and she had to start translating, sitting on the stairs. And then the secret police started spreading the rumor that she was in fact spying for them. And as a result, she was shunned at work. And they also started calling her in to interrogate her about her life and about the people that she knew about her friends. And she writes about her interrogators and what it was like to live in fear of the king who bows down and kills. At every interrogation, when he felt he had me checkmate, the interrogator would say to me in triumph, you see, everything is connected. Without knowing why, he was right. He had no idea of all the things that were connected in my head against him. That he was sitting at a big polished desk and I was at a small table made of filthy, badly planed wood. You see, yes, I could see the table's surface, covered in scores from the interrogations of other people I knew nothing of, not even if they were still alive. Because I had to look at him for hours on end, the interrogator became the king in the course of every interrogation. For his bald patch, he could have used my grandfather's regimental barber. And a few weeks later, the king came not just into his missing hair, but into my own hair. Again, curls of sunlight lay on the floor between our two desks. Longer than usual, snaking brightly, they crawled back and forth because there was a high wind outside. The interrogator was pacing up and down. He was nervous. The plain shadows were so restless he couldn't keep his eyes off them. Between my real but motionless presence and the plain shadows, which were there only as a reflection but which skipped around crazily, he lost control. He screamed as he paced back and forth. I was expecting a slap. He raised his hand, but then he took a stray hair from my shoulder and was about to let it fall to the floor from two outstretched fingers. I don't know why I suddenly said, please put that hair back. It belongs to me. And as a result of these encounters with the Ceausescu dictatorship and the secret police, she started to associate with other people who were outsiders, who were maybe not even necessarily resisting or politically active, but who were certainly not in agreement with the way their country was being run. And um, this had a kind of a vicious circle effect, so she came more and more under the purview of the secret police. And they did what they could to discredit her and to disrupt her life. They wrote anonymous letters to German news agencies denouncing her as a government agent, and a lot of the German news agencies took these pieces of false information up and they actually made it look like she was a government spy for the Romanian secret police. In 1979 then she lost her job as a translator and she began working part-time as a teacher. 
and by this time she'd already been writing poems and stories for several years. She also started associating with a group of dissident writers that was banned by the Securitate in um, 1976. And in 1982, she published her first novel with the title Niederungen, which um, we read some of in English translation as Nadirs. Niederungen means something like low points. But it also resonates with the word Erniedrigung, which is humiliation. And that's precisely what we see being described. We see a life marked by humiliation, humiliation of people by other people, of innocent children by their parents, humiliation of animals by their owners, and even of a person by their own thoughts. And when it appeared, it had already been the subject of a lot of back and forth with the Romanian publisher because they considered a lot of it to simply not be publishable in that country. And when it did appear, it wasn't completely as she had written it anymore. She had to strike um, quite a bit of it. And what's more, parts of it had already appeared in local German language newspapers. And the German population, um, when they read it, they were extremely unhappy about what Müller had written. Um, they felt that she was exposing them and humiliating them and speaking out in ways that she simply should not have. In the years that follow, her life in Romania became increasingly difficult. She wrote in The King That Bows Down and Kills. Then, in the next few years, I did have friends who were tailed and regularly interrogated, whose flats were searched, whose manuscripts were seized, who were banned from studying and arrested. What I had initially experienced as an oppressive atmosphere became real fear. My friends were tortured and I knew precisely where and how. We spent whole days talking about it, caught between humor and fear, foolhardy and on edge. We looked for ways out, but there were none, and reneging on our own actions was unthinkable. The reprisals edged into my life. Several years later they edged beneath my skin. I was asked to spy on my colleagues in the factory, and I refused and everything I knew from friends about interrogations, house searches, and death threats happened to me. I was used to reflecting on this, how the next interrogation, the next day's work, the next street corner laid traps. And she also describes how among her friends, they reacted to the fear that they felt and the persecution that they felt sometimes in acts of writing, sometimes in conversation where they made jokes about power, sometimes inventing fairy tales. And this is kind of a key to understanding Hertha Müller's writing, a sort of a coded response to the fear of power, the fear of what happens when power finds its way into your most intimate sphere of life. The struggle against power and the struggle against fear had become for Hertha Müller a struggle for language and for words to discover the magic and the power, the power of the resistance that language can offer. Aware that eyes made wide by fear and a disconnection in the head cause all words to flee, both written and spoken, I nevertheless had to add something in writing upon the death of two friends. Just as I once sought words for milk thistle back in the large, bright green valley, so I sought out words to describe the fear we all experienced. I wanted to show how friendship looks when there is no knowing whether one will be alive this evening, tomorrow morning, next week. As Hertha Müller became more widely known, she started to travel and she visited Germany several times. And then in 1987, she moved there permanently. But she continued to be watched from afar by the Romanian secret police and she even continued to receive death threats from them. 
But more than that, her world continued, and, and it still continues to this day, to be structured by the struggles for personal integrity and dignity that um, had formed her as a writer. The king followed me, first from the village to the city, then from Romania to Germany, as a reflection of what could never be clarified for me. He personalized the scale of things. If, in the confusion inside my head, no word comes to mind, to this day I say, here comes the king. The pursuit of a safe, pure inner world always brings her to the limits of language. It's not true that there are words for everything, nor is it true that we always think in words. To this day there are many things I think that aren't in words, and I haven't found any, not in the German of the villages nor the cities, not in Romanian, not in the German of East or West Germany, and in no books. Our inner regions do not correspond to language. They pull us there where words cannot reside. Often, what we have nothing more to say about is what really matters and the impulse to talk about it works well because it passes it by. We see this in the magic that hair, hands, animals can bring into the world. Always these are objects of struggle. Hands can suffer in work or they can make new things come into being. And animals can be brutalized by human beings or they can bear some kind of a secret meaning which may even be a key to understanding what life is all about. In Germany, she started making poems out of collages, out of words that she had cut out of newspapers and magazines. As she tells us in The King Bows Down and Kills, Then I began cutting words out of newspapers. At first, that led me past the rhymes. It started as a way of keeping in touch with friends during my frequent travels, of putting something personal in the envelope rather than postcards of places th seen through the jingoistic lens of a photographer. While reading the newspaper on a train, I stuck a fragment of a photograph and some words together on a white card, or perhaps one or two sentences. The stubborn word so, or if there really is a place, then it touches longing. The amazement created by loose newspaper words resulted in rhymes. I have long cut words out at home. They seem to lie indiscriminately on the table. I looked at them, and it was remarkable how many rhymed. Trusting the rhymes of Theodore Kramer and Inge Müller, I accepted those rhymes for which I had done nothing, which had come together by chance on the table's surface. The words had got to know each other because they had to share the space they lay on. I couldn't chase them away, so I discovered the taste for rhyming. The language that can speak of this king, this heart beast, is something that is intensely personal, but it's also something which is simply there, simply lying around, just waiting to be found and swept up and collected and assembled. And this is a little bit confusing when we read the poems because they seem to bear meaning, but they also seem to resist meaning. And I think this is also an important key to understanding Hertha Müller's work. She has continued to speak out against what she sees as contemporary dictators and their populist followers. So in 2014, she said of Putin, he insults my intelligence. Every day he insults all of our intelligence. He continues to lie, and I take it personally. In 2018, she criticized the right-wing political movement Alternative für Deutschland, the alternative for Germany, which was rapidly gaining power at the time. And she also criticized the way the media gave them undue publicity and therefore undue power. Once again, this theme, writing, can either support or it can resist power. In 2009, Hertha Müller was given the Nobel Prize for Literature as someone who, with the concentration of poetry and the frankness of prose, depicts the landscape of the dispossessed.